Hello, everyone. Welcome to Planning Ahead for CRM at Your Nonprofit, the second in our three-part series on getting CRM ready. I'm Keith Heller, and I'm Principal and CEO of Heller Consulting. Uh, we have helped nonprofits the past 16 years with their technology needs, 900 clients, 1,800 projects, offices around the country, uh, about 38 people, and lots of certifications. So uh, we really enjoy the work that we do. Uh, we work with technology and systems. Or we work with people and we work with uh, strategy, uh, particularly social and online, and we bring all of those together to help you drive your mission forward. Um, more information about all these topics available at the connectedcause.com, our blog site. Uh, you'll find us and many of our colleagues and partners blogging there, and uh, lots of great information. We publish a couple times a week, so I encourage you to go there. And I want to take a minute here to introduce uh, Lisa Faye Wellick. She's our co-presenter today from JDR App. Lisa Faye, do you want to say a few things? Sure. Thanks, Keith. Um, I'm Lisa Fay from JDRF, and let me share with you a little bit about JDRF. Um, we have 109 chapters and branches in the United States and seven international affiliates. affiliates. We raise about $200 million annually, mostly through uh, our walk, special events, although we do have a very robust individual and major giving program. So about three years ago, our leadership recognized that our state of technology did not prepare us for the future. We funded and then engaged in a massive CRM and online giving project. Our goal was to have one donor record with all participation and giving. Well, from the onset, we worked with Heller Consulting, who was our implementation partner, project manager, advisor, and so, so, so much more. We're almost there. Take it away, Keith. Thanks. And throughout the webinar, uh, Lisa Faye is going to be uh, relating uh, the story of their implementation to bring some real world experience to uh, some of the topics that we're going to cover today. And those topics uh, include how to identify and prioritize your CRM goals and objectives, uh, how to create an inventory of your existing systems, where are you today? Design your organization's future CRM environment. Start to get a picture of where you want to be. What's the end state look like? And then how are you going to get there, which is through a phased implementation. No one gets there uh, in one fell swoop in one project. Uh, CRM is, is too big to swallow whole. You have to take bits and pieces. Um, now, one could do it technically. Uh, theoretically, you could do it all, all at once. but but we don't change that quickly as people. Organizations don't change that quickly. And so you want to do it incrementally and intelligently. So, so that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and finally, key to making that kind of change is communication. Uh, this may be even more important than technology sometimes, and you'll hear me touch on that point a number of times. But um, those are our topics, so let's dive in. The first part is we're going to take stock. What are our goals and objectives? in moving forward with an, a CRM project. So it's very important to uh, decide ahead of time what your finish line is going to look like so when you succeed, you know that you succeed. When you finished, you know that you finished uh, when you've hit major milestones. Now, you'll see here in the top, I've referenced a resource, the CRM Ready Workbook. So that is going to be uh, available to you following the three-part series. Uh, the last of our webinars is in two weeks, and that's on successfully implementing CRM. But after that webinar, we're going to publish a CRM Ready Workbook, which is going to be a place where you can uh, collect information about your organization and record it and use it to help uh, uh, design your plans and move forward with CRM. Uh, I'm going to, it's going to be referenced on a number of these slides today because some of the questions that we're asking, there's going to be room for you to record your responses in that workbook. Uh, now, if you can't wait, uh, please do start to write these things down. It's very important that you that you give them thought, and uh, and then when that workbook comes out, you'll have a single place to go. Um, so the questions uh, uh, regarding the finish line. So you're going to know you got there uh, when you're able to capitalize on particular opportunities. So you want to articulate what is it? If we have CRM, what are we going to be able to do that we can't do now? What problems are going to be resolved? How do we hope that our work will improve? What's our goal around that? And most importantly, I think, how is the constituent experience of our organization going to improve? So that's, that's questions to consider about the finish line. Please, Faye, can you say a little bit about what indicators show that we're successful with CRM? 
Yes. Um, so keep in mind that our vision was one donor record having participation and giving. So imagine yourself there. So externally, it's, it's all about the donors. So you have an increased reach because all of your data is in one CRM. Uh, and, and that includes a streamlined approach to how you use the web. Um, in the engagement arena, you'll be able to tailor your efforts and steward your donors based on their preferences. Results, more people are involved in more ways in the way they want to be involved and interact with your organization. Internally, this is about making the case to those that are actually working in the system the kind of off side of it. Well, you're going to be more efficient because all of your information is in that one donor record, which makes for easier reporting and reporting that tells you more about your business. It answers questions about the initiatives that you try, and you'll be able to measure and see what's working and what's not working. And Lisa Faye, you know, I'd add in there, I'd, I'd note that uh, you said a number of times the relationship with donors, but I know at JDRF, uh, as a result of CRM, you're going to be able to better engage with those people who uh, have a, a diagnosis or whose loved ones have a diagnosis and provide better service to them, whether they're donors or not. Uh, and likewise, with the, uh, with the researchers that you fund, uh, you're going to have a better uh, uh, understanding of what they're doing and, 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 and provide better information to them over time as, as they become part of the CRM. So it goes beyond donors to uh, encompass multiple constituencies. Absolutely. We're able to collect all of that information um, through our web forms and then build a plan for those newly diagnosed, uh, newly diagnosed patients to involve them in, in JDRF in the future. And you know, this, folks, is a topic that we, we, that we covered in great depth in the first webinar. We invite you to, to uh, view that one online. But uh, the, 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 the wonder of CRM is it's not just about any particular group of people. It's not just about donors, not just about the beneficiaries of your mission, not just about those who are partners in your mission, but it's about bringing all that information together. So, and maybe uh, uh, with that, Lisa, you can tell us a little bit more about the benefits of CRM. Absolutely. So um, I know that this is a summary slide from the first Teller webinar, and that webinar is viewable online, and there has a lot more detail about these uh, various bullet points you see on the screen. I will say that at JDRF, we talked about all of these benefits, uh, particularly the 360-degree view of a donor. From the very beginning of our project with multiple audiences, we got to the point where our groups of end users were evangelists for the project and could speak to all of these things themselves. It was really the perfect model for us, end user to end user. It really worked well. Now, in terms of next steps for your organization, so take these points that were brought up in the past slides and and brainstorm for your organization, what are your measures of success? Think about your audiences, external and internal, and, and articulate those measures of success accordingly. As far as prioritization, um, at JDRF, we have, we have several venues to ensure we stayed on target with, with our vision. Um, one such venue for prioritization was something that we called a peer review group. It's a very small group of very savvy, chapter users, and, and they were here to help us make decisions. We went so far as to have this group actually author memos about our status. This was particularly helpful when things got a little bumpy. Kind of that peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication was really effective for us. Ultimately, for JDRF, our vision and ultimate success factor is one donor record with participation and giving. That single focus has driven our priorities, design, and all of our phases. So that's great. And, and when you've uh, put together your list of what it's going to, what success is going to look like for you, you can then start to dive into some more details. And the next piece is taking stock of your software, your systems, and your processes. So we suggest starting that with something we call a systems inventory. And that uh, workbook that I mentioned earlier 
um, there's going to be a place in that workbook for you to record your inventory, and it's going to prompt you uh, around some of the questions you're going to see in the next few slides. So a systems inventory follows this path. What systems do you currently have? What are they doing? What are they failing to do? This is, people, are, people are usually very articulate about this. Uh, why are they failing? So you see here we break this down into more questions, and this is pretty important. Technology, processes, skills, strategy. These are all ways in which systems can, uh, can start to uh, be insufficient. But what you'll notice here is that only one of the four is about technology itself. The other three are about people and processes. Right? And this is, this is a pretty fair representation of uh, what causes uh, difficulties with software and systems in, in, in CRM. Is, uh, you know, one out of four times is the technology, and three out of four is something else. So it's really important to understand why your systems, your current systems aren't working. And if it's about, uh, let's say, strategy there at the bottom, well, it's really important going into the CRM project that you correct that issue, that you have and define a strategy going in. That's what those, those uh, setting, goal setting slides were about, you know, that you understand why we're getting the system. If it's a skills issue for your current systems, well, then let's make sure that training uh, and retraining uh, uh, constant re-education is part of the CRM adoption plan and processes. You know, if it's inconsistent, if it's not clear how to use the system, then again, as you move towards adopting CRM, let's not replicate that issue. Right? So that's why we spend a little bit more time there trying to understand why the systems we have don't feel like they're working so that we don't replicate those problems. And then finally, what new systems might you need in the future? So what you're trying to do is get a whole big list of what you have and what you think you're going to have over the next couple of years. So in, in helping you uh, investigate and unearth uh, what these different systems might be, here's another way to look at it uh, in a little more detail. So uh, from the perspective of these maybe four areas of the business, uh, fundraising, there's going to be a core donor database, an event system perhaps, volunteer perhaps. Online, you're going to have a website, CMS. You might have giving, registration, et cetera. Uh, likewise, different programs that, uh, and software and systems that support your mission, and over on the IT and admin side as well. So we're trying to give you some, some pointers to finding all of, uh, all of the systems that you may, might have hiding here and there. Uh, the, here's another way to look at it. Uh, this, we went over this slide in more detail in the first webinar, uh, but here we can look at it from the perspective of what data and systems might be attached to these different areas, to these different constituencies? Um, what business processes might be used by these different slices? Right? And so, uh, again, this can help you contribute to your list. Now, uh, when you have that list of just names of software and such uh, and departments, well, then there's a much deeper place to go. Uh, now, this slide, I have to admit, is, is the ugliest slide in the deck, and that's because they let me uh, design it. So you can trust me much more with my CRM advice than you can with my design skills. But uh, this is uh, pulled from the CRM Ready Workbook, and uh, it'll be a place where you can record much more detail about your systems. It's not required right off the bat to provide that much detail, but at some point you'll find you end up thinking about and answering all these questions. So it's nice to start to uh, have a place to articulate it. So the goal is to be able to design something like this, which is to map out and list all the different systems that you have, and sort of their, a little bit their relationship to each other. And this is going to be, uh, we're going to go into more detail uh, because this is from JDRF and the environment they had uh, prior to their CRM project. Um, but you know, this list you're making of all these systems, eventually you're going to stand in front of a whiteboard uh, and, and try to diagram it out in some way. And then you'll probably drop it into PowerPoint, and you'll hear why this is so important and, and effective over time. So likewise, on the business process side, you'll be making an uh, inventory of the various business practices that you have. And these usually relate to your systems, although you can have business practices that aren't related to a particular piece of software. Um, but again, you can look at it from the point of view of the different departments. So in the fundraising department, we're managing constituents, we're entering gifts, we're 
sending thank you letters. The online side, we're publishing content. We're sending mass emails. On the mission side, we're managing cases and clients, and perhaps we're uh, generating fee for service and recording that revenue, et cetera. Uh, over on the admin side, a really big one, the GL reconciliation. Recon reconciliation process has to happen with any other system that's generating uh, revenue or recording revenue. So again, you list out all these business processes because they're going to shift over time as you adopt new systems and, and adopt CRM. So with all this information, please Faye, what do we do? Well, all the information you see on the slide on the left side, systems inventory, sample reports and lists, business processes, existing process documents, et cetera, et cetera, all this information comes to light. It comes together in what's called the discovery phase. We thought of it as a treasure hunt because that's kind of what it was. We were trying to unearth things through our deep dives with our staff and our IT uh, team. Discovery unearths everything and enables those discussions about priorities, phases, and gaps. What you choose to implement must roll up into your vision and enable your success factors. It also has an added benefit, this discovery phase has an added benefit of losing legacy processes. We really, um, we really uh, uh, use this phase to get rid of a lot of stuff. Um, at JDRF, we, we humanize discovery by involving our end users and department heads. It was a key part of our change management strategy. Um, our philosophy was that the CRM and business applications departments can provide guidance, and, and we certainly have an opinion, but ultimately we really wanted the business to take ownership of their system from the start. And this discovery phase is really what, what enabled that um, kind of ownership, taking that ownership. They embraced their role. It got them even more excited about the project and its potential because we were able to talk about what is it we want to do. And we're going to try and make that happen. As drab as, as discovery may seem on paper, um, it, it can be creative, collaborative, exciting, and fun as well. We really, really enjoyed this part of the project. And I have to say, uh, Lisa Faye, that you folks did it really well. Uh, to start to use this, like you say, potentially drab process, as part of your change management, as part of involving people in the process, that's such a big deal. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about communication later. We're going to talk about change management in the next webinar. It's absolutely key. And involving people early and often it, uh, really helps to, to support the project. I want to point out another couple of things I, I really liked uh, that you said. Uh, even in this phase, you're starting to lose legacy processes. You're, the, you're, you're, noting, hey, here's some inefficiencies. We can start to change those today. We don't have to wait for our new system. And that's, that's a really neat thing that we see is that even just going through this process, you're starting to gain benefits and move forward uh, uh, even before you start to, to implement new software or anything else. The other nice thing about this phase is it helps, uh, like you say, in this, in this treasure hunt. Now, sometimes what you find are, you know, little landmines that, that thank goodness are never going to go off, right? So you can, you can identify gotchas before they happen. And also what's really neat is this uh, balloon in the middle where interviews with staff, sometimes some of the problems that you identify as you go through this process, staff have fantastic answers to them because they've lived with these problems every day. They've thought about how they would solve them. They just didn't have the opportunity to talk about it or the systems to support it. So even though these types of discovery processes uncover issues, they can also uncover solutions and, and right from inside your own team, which is really neat. It's also, I, I just want to add one more thing to this. It, it also is a good place to have some expectations management as well. I mean, we also use these uh, meetings as a way to kind of socialize people that after we deployed our CRM, there would be bumps. And that is normal and that is to be expected. And someone might request um, something that maybe might not be possible in phase one of the CRM, but we still gathered all those requirements and listened and messaged back to them what we could and couldn't do early on. So at, at the end of the day, no one was angry about anything because they knew exactly what they were getting. 
I thought this was the part where we told them that CRM was going to do everything they ever wanted, including make their coffee when they get into the office. Is it, where, do, where do we – what phase is that? <laughs> <laughs> that, might be, uh, that might be the next slide, Keith. Yeah, right, right. All right. Well, with that, let's let's talk about how this comes together. So you've got this all this information now, uh, and and this information is about where are we today. So now you want to start to define what's it going to look like when we get to the end. So um, again, uh, Lisa Faye, we've got we've got your planet slides. Maybe you can walk us through these a little bit. Great. Where's the uh, coffee mug on this? Um, so this was our our desired end state. You see here that is phase two. Um, this really wasn't phase two. This was more like phase 12. Um, but that aside, intuitively, there are fewer bubbles on this slide than, there, than, than what you saw on the slide a few prior to this. Um, you start to see the end. You visualize the end. What does it look like? This is very similar to JDRF's end. Where does your organization want to be? This is powerful, clean, and an intuitive visual. Um, we use this a lot to socialize and sell this project because would you rather see this or the one with all of the bubbles that didn't really talk to each other? So this is what you want, but now comes the hard part. Ask yourself, can you get there? And if so, how and where do you start? So thinking through your design a little bit, you kind of know what your desired end state is. You have that mapped out. You know where you are. You know where you want to go. Here are a few things to keep in mind throughout the project. Are you in control to change? So you're likely not system developers. You're probably going to deploy an already existing application that will have limitations. It will do great things for you, but it also will have limitations. And there are some things that cannot change. Some are mandated by your funders. JDRF used this project, our CRM deployment project, to not only change processes, but how we interact with the system. You have to recognize that you can change a lot, but perhaps not everything you might want to. Some things are out of your control. It's complex. You may have overlapping constituents. You may have uh, conflicting business practice or similar business practice, and you also might have overlapping users. These are all things that need to be discussed and worked out, and I know that Heller has suggestions for identifying and managing this. Keith? Sure. Um, so with that goal of uh, uh, JDRF's nice clean slide that has the three bubbles, uh, I thought I'd present another uh, version, uh, maybe a little less clean here, but, but uh, I, I'm going to call it rich and be generous to us. But here's a way also to think about what your end state CRM might look like. And this was discussed at greater length in the, in the, in the first webinar. But here's your takeaway. Again, three bubbles, the planet, uh, donor, mission, online engagement. Those are the key systems that we see, let's say, outside of what you would have for HR admin finance, uh, which you may tie into. But you have these three key components. Um, they're tied together with data integrations. They're made to work well based on uh, good business practices and good internal communication. Information might be summarized through business intelligence. And it's all in support of strategy. So this can be a starting slide. And you can add and take away the things that are, that are useful to you. So how do you get from uh, the discovery process and everything you have today uh, to that final environment? Uh, and it takes planning. Um, that's uh, uh, that's absolutely key. So, Lisa Faye, maybe you could tell us a little bit here about how JDRF did it. So, I love this slide because, in particular, I love the how, how long part of it, and that might may differ depending on the size and complexity of of an organization for sure. But it's really good for your stakeholders and senior management to know that this is something that can't be done in three months or six months. Um, again, it depends on your, your circumstance, but you know, at JDRF, this, this took years. Um, so why? Well, getting from the many bubbles to the fewer requires phases. 
again, you can't do it in one phase, and you don't want to start your project off with unrealistic expectations. Change management is a separate stream of work. People need to get involved. They need to understand the change. They need to absorb the change. We started our change strategy a year before we deployed CRM, maybe even more than a year before we deployed CRM. We had people involved in our application selection. The nature of it from an IT perspective takes time. You need to do it correctly. You need to make sure that you have the right skill set on your staff, whether you're hiring internal resources with the deep and broad skill sets that are needed for this, or you engage a firm such as Heller who has this on their team. Either way, you need to make sure that your IT and applications team, teams are uh, ready for this change. Also, another thing that we kept in mind all the time was that we could not disrupt fundraising. We had to keep that going. That's our bread and butter. So by engaging our end users and hearing from them about their timelines and their events and their walk uh, season, we were able to kind of slide things in and deploy things in a way that caused the least disruption for them. Believe me, if you have them engaged in the very beginning and you need them in a pinch at a bad time, they'll help you. They will absolutely help you and they'll help you enthusiastically, but you just have to be considerate and keep that in mind throughout the project. I think another important thing to add to this is be flexible. Unexpected things may happen. You may have to adjust your course. We joked earlier that the phase two slide was really phase 12 slide, phase 12, or I'm sorry, there were 12 phases. Well, Socialize this possibility with your audiences and your senior management well in advance. Things happen, you may have to add, you may have to change course, you may have to adjust. The key is messaging and having people on board with you as you move through the project. Uh, next slide, Keith. Great, I'd just like to add uh, one thing about the how long. This does this depend a lot on the size and scope of your organization. So where for GDRF, they are in that you know two to three year uh, timeline for, for this kind of project. Others are going to find themselves in a nine to 12 month, 12 to 18 month. It really does decide a lot on, on the scale of what you're trying to change and, and your organization's readiness for change. So, all right, let's think through those phases. Well, this was a very easy win for us. Um, we, we retired our legacy system. That was a really, really easy one to retire, simply because uh, it caused us the most pain and needed to be modernized. So by modernizing it, we had a huge uh, opportunity there. Um, it was generally disliked by all of our users. Actually, a lot of people didn't even use it and, ha and maintained their donor information in an Excel spreadsheet. We were able to really capitalize on this. There was really nowhere else to go but up, and everyone knew it. So that pick an easy win if you can. That really, really helped us. Yeah, and, and you know, for those where the, the first system to, to be changed isn't as obvious, you can apply these questions to that inventory earlier. Which of the systems would be most easily retired? Which are causing the greatest pain? Now, they may not be the same ones because easy to retire, uh, you know, might be different than causing greatest pain. What, what represents the greatest opportunity? What would we be able to do much more effectively if we had a new system? And which ones are people willing to part with? So if you can, you can kind of, you know, pick your top three or four or five uh, out of your inventory for each of these questions and then see which of those systems um, was in you know the top five for each of these questions, and, and maybe start with there being where you what would you retire first? So this is strikingly similar to what JDRF looked like about two years ago. Um, you can see here many bubbles. Um, none of these bubbles talk to each other, um, and it certainly does not make for easy or efficient reporting and really even knowing what your donor, how much your donors give. Um, this is what we stro strove to streamline. This model grew organically, um, but 
clearly cannot support our need in today's world to see our donors more efficiently and differently. Um, lots of bubbles, and you'll see the next slide has... Yes, let me just note that this, this representation uh, really strikes people when they see it all laid out. Most people, when they see their systems shown on a single slide, go, wow, we have got a lot. No wonder it's hard to get things done around here. And then, you know, when you're able to map out what things will look like at the end of CRM in this slide. So now here in this slide you see, actually, Keith, I'm going to ask you just to go back one more. I want to say one more thing. Um, the little bubble on the left where it says chapter CRM systems, that kind of cluster of bubbles, well, we had over 750 data sources in addition to a legacy CRM. So now you can flip to the next slide and start to see that we really have everything now in one CRM. We have all of those, uh, the 750 spreadsheets in our legacy CRM, all of that now is in one place. Um, you can start to see these things talking to each other. And there were a few phases, again, between what you saw in the prior slide and this one. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't two, two phases and we're, we're not quite there yet, but this is our end state and this is what we're striving toward right now. And should we show uh, should we show what you're what you're getting to in the in the interim? Absolutely. All right. So again, we're going from here, eventually here, and in the interim, we're here. So in the interim, we're here. This is pretty uh, a pretty accurate representation of where we are today. Um, we have moved to a new CRM platform. We've been on that for one year. Most of those data sources, those 750 chapter external data sources are on our CRM right now. We have a few more left to bring on. Uh, and our legacy system has fully been brought on. We have a lot of data on our CRM. Um, we also are our online president presence, meaning our web forms and our online fundraising systems, that is now talking to our CRM. So basically, if you update one system, you update the other. And we're close to having that 360-degree view of giving. Uh, in, in our CRM, that's kind of the repository for everything. Um, so we're here, and um, I think you know we have a little bit, a little bit more to go, um, but we're almost there. You know what I love about this slide is that it's proof that it can be done. I and mean, we we've done it, and you can do it if you plan and resource accordingly. I, I can't stress that enough um, in terms of thinking about how you want to get to your end state. And Lisa Faye, I get a kick out of when you say uh, there's, a little, there's a little bit more to be done because if you move to a good CRM platform, there's always a little bit more to get done, be done. And, and I remember with your legacy system, um, the more to get done over there was simply to band-aid, to figure out workarounds, to, 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 to try and you know, uh, tamp down the issues. With that, with that system, and that, and that we're driving people to to all of their rogue spreadsheets and, and access databases and things. Then, in moving to adopting a more modern CRM platform, now there's always going to be something more because that platform is also evolving and presenting more opportunities to the organization. And I think the organization thinks uh, more broadly and sees more opportunities than it ever might have in the past, simply because the the, the prior systems are so limiting. So, so you're and, you're never going to be without something new, uh, next on your list. <laughs> well, it, yeah, exactly, and that's kind of where we're at now. You know, the CRM blue bubble there. Well, it's it's not it doesn't just replace what we had before. It's opened a whole new world to new of new capabilities and features, and we are we are activating those. So you're right. It never really is done, and nor should it ever be done because we're evolving our CRM along with. Uh, how the nonprofit world needs to fundraise. That's perfect, perfect. Well, that was the vision. So how do we get there? Again, key component, communication. So we're going to talk a bit about communication plans here and give you some samples. So why is a communication plan important? Because we, people, all of us, freak out about change. Change is daunting. It, it can be scary. Uh, what does this, you know, what does the change in systems mean for my job? 
Uh, are people going to be measuring me? Are they going to be looking over my shoulder? Am I going to be asked to learn something new? Am I going to be asked to do something different? Is my job going to go away? All these different things really you know, spring in people's minds when they hear we're going to do this big project. Um, and 99% and of those fears never come true. Um, uh, you know, CRM really is there to better support people in doing those parts of their jobs that they're probably more interested in and that, and that better use their talents. Uh, most of us in nonprofits did not uh, uh, get into this field because, well, okay, present company accepted, because we wanted to play with technology. Um, you know, we want those systems to support us to go out there and build uh, deeper relationships and expand the reach of our mission. So um, one of the earliest things to do in communicating around the project is to talk about why your organization is doing the project. What's the vision? What's the big picture? How is doing this project going to help, uh, in the end, your constituents? How are you going to be able to reach more people, engage more deeply, uh, expand uh, how much of your mission is delivered? And it's really important to start with that. It's more important that people understand the why of the project uh, initially, then the what and the how. And you, quite often people will kick off a project by saying, well, here's what we're going to do and here's how we're going to go about it. And, and that leaves people really kind of stuck because that's not as important to them and it kind of raises, raises more questions than it answers. But if we start with the why we're doing the project, then people can settle into the how and the what uh, and get on board. A lot, uh, a lot better. And there you see that last bullet. I can't emphasize it enough. Project success is more dependent on communication than on technology. We see that time and time again. So how do you go about it? Well, you want to develop a plan. Uh, we have a couple plans on the next couple slides that we'll show you. A simple one and a more sophisticated one. But let's talk through some of the key elements. What's going to be communicated? Well, uh, you're going to talk. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. You're going to talk about what's already happened in the project or what's happened most recently, what's going to happen next, and how does that all tie out to the big picture. Now, again, that tie out to the big picture is an always important. When you communicate, uh, uh, you're going to talk about good news, of course. That's easy. But also talk about setbacks. It's really important to be transparent. Uh, that really builds trust. Um, people expect that there will be setbacks in projects like these. No one has ever been through a project where there weren't setbacks. So if you try to uh, uh, communicate as if there aren't going to be or haven't been any setbacks, it, it erodes a sense of trust. And, and like Lisa Fay mentioned earlier in, in, in one of her uh, stories out of their project, when people hear about setbacks, um, they, they can step forward and help. So the response that you're concerned about uh, may not be the response you get. Uh, you might be pleasantly surprised. So again, transparency is very important. To whom, are you trans, uh, to whom are you communicating? All stakeholders, which is everyone internally who's concerned about the project, everyone externally who might be interested in the project, gets summary information. Okay? The implementation team gets the details. Where things get a little uh, uh, mixed up for people is when uh, organizations give stakeholders too much detail. Again, you want to keep it at the summary level for the broader stakeholder group. When do these communications happen? Periodically, you want to set up a schedule, usually something monthly or quarterly. Um, and then there will be particular milestones that should be noted, celebrated, um, and, and we'll see that in the plan as well. Who's doing those communications? There will be a communication lead on your team, um, and they'll be part of the regular communications and the milestone communications. And then executive sponsors uh, should be part of the communications plan at the milestone so that when big exciting things happen, or even small exciting things happen that are noteworthy, the exec there should be some comment by the executive sponsor about, again, you know, congratulations, hey, this is what we did, this is why it's important, this is why the project's important, here's how it ties out to the big picture. So always kind of bringing it back to that. And overall, a communication plan is real important because um, it, it supports buy-in, it supports people feeling good about the CRM, feeling like if they, it, it's theirs, they are, their input has been part of it. Um, and that happens by osmosis. It doesn't happen by, you know, a big uh, uh, flowery announcement at the beginning and a, and a big party at the end. All the way along the line, people need to 
to be informed and be aware of what's going on, even if they're not directly engaged in that part of the project. And that consistency of communication paired with transparency really supports uh, uh, people uh, being able to adopt the CRM and feel like it's theirs. So here's a very simple plan. Um, there's four items around which they communicated. There was a weekly project update, a weekly standing meeting, a monthly update, and milestone reporting. Uh, you see the frequency there. Uh, now, who is involved? The weekly uh, sessions and, and, and communications were just the people who were really engaged in the project directly. But the purpose of it was because um, not every person is going to be engaged in every part of the project as deeply. But you want to have, uh, within the project team, uh, cross-fertilization of knowledge so that the left hand and the right hand know what each other is doing. Uh, sometimes you have it. It's not left and right hand, it's more like an octopus. <laughs> so keep everybody knowing what everybody else is doing is very useful. Um, and then a monthly update uh, for this plan went to all stakeholders. Um, so there was a, uh, you know, it can be as simple as, a, as, a, as an email that says, okay, folks, this is what we did this month. This is what we did. Uh, this is what we're going to do. And don't forget, this is the value of this project. Um, and that can be handled by the uh, internal project manager. Uh, for the client of the organization. And then the milestone reporting is, again, when you have special events uh, in the project that you want to celebrate and make note of. That goes out to all stakeholders. And that's a combination of the internal project manager. And again, the executive sponsor then chiming in and reminding everybody that this project has executive support and that, uh, again, it's, it's pointed towards and in support of the broader mission. So that's a simple plan, and uh, Lisa Faye, if you could share a bit about uh, your folks' more sophisticated plan. Absolutely. Um, so just let me just say that it would have been really difficult for JDRF to get where we are now without the structure shown in this slide. Um, you know, we had uh, weekly meetings with our vendor partners with Heller. Um, there was much documentation uh, on a monthly basis. Um, we had an executive risk and scope review, which was really very key because we were able to identify and mitigate risk really early on. Um, and we also had this peer review group that I mentioned earlier involved with us in helping us make those decisions. Again, um, having end users involved in, in that aspect of it as well was very helpful to us. And then, of course, we all regrouped quarterly. Um, Something really important to note, um, I mostly worked, I was on the project team, but I also worked um, in the organizational-wide communications uh, piece of this, and that was a large part of what I did, is, is kind of converting these weekly, monthly, and quarterly status updates, I say the good, the bad, and the ugly, with our various audiences so that they knew every step of the way how we were doing and why it was important to them, what did it mean to them. Um, it's, it's really important to have that um, have that function. Um, we really attacked on on all fronts. I mean, the project team certainly um, you know kept things moving. That was really important. Identified risks, but we also messaged this out to every possible um, audience through town hall call meetings, memos, individual calls. We had various working groups. We really used every piece of this as part of our change management strategy. Um, I do want to say kind of a final point in, in retrospect on the project team aspect of it, the weekly, monthly, quarterly meetings and updates. This structure enabled JDRF and all of our vendor partners, Heller Consulting, to always be in sync. We were always, always, always in sync with the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, it, it led to efficient, consistent, and, and successful deployment. So to give an example of that, someone could walk by my office and ask a question about something, and I would give an answer. That same person could ask someone from Teller Consulting, and they would give the same answer. We were all absolutely in lockstep and on the same page as we worked through what, what has been a very, very complex project with many, many moving parts. I can't stress this enough. When I initially saw kind of our, our schedule in terms of of meetings, I, I, I was a little like, wow, that's a lot of meetings. But um, at the end, it really wasn't a lot of meetings, and the time was really used extremely well, and it just kept us moving. And I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. It's 
to take those meetings and translate that into useful mes messages for your uh, stakeholders and all of your audiences. Um, really important. I think all that effort really pays off again in people feeling like uh, the system is theirs, it's relevant to them, mm -hmm. that it was implemented by people who are listening, who are responsive, who knew what they were doing uh, and had a plan. You know, clearly if 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 staff asked you one question and asked someone else another question and they got different answers, that would, that would sort of be a red flag to people in the organization. That didn't happen. Instead, they felt comfortable that, that, um, that the team that was putting things in place knew what they were doing. So key to feeling positive about the CRM. So um, well, we thank you for, for your attendance today. And uh, we have some next steps for you. Uh, first of all, we hope that you found this really helpful. Um, please do uh, sign up for the next webinar on implementing CRM successfully. Uh, join our LinkedIn group. That's where we're taking questions and, and responding and, and really hosting a conversation. Uh, we respond, your peers, our colleagues in the field, uh, a lot of CRM expertise there. Uh, so please uh, uh, look for that, the CRM Ready group on LinkedIn. Uh, please subscribe to the Connected Cause and you'll get our uh, regular postings on these topics. Uh, take a look at the JBRF case study that you'll find there. And then uh, take advantage of the free CRM readiness assessment. You'll be getting an email about that. And finally, please, please, please don't do nothing. Uh, we really, uh, you know, this is an exciting time to be engaging in CRM for nonprofits. There's a tremendous amount that you can go and do, and we encourage you to uh, take, that, take those next steps. Uh, and finally, thank you, Lisa Fay, for joining us. Really uh, very, very pleased to have you part of this. You're welcome, Keith. I love talking about this. I'm as enthusiastic as you are about it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Till the next time.